is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love. Welcoming you back to the Love You Podcast, where you can learn everything you need to know about dating, relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. We've got a juicy podcast called Do You Feel Like You're Not Good Enough? Before we get into that, I just want to remind you that I'm offering you a special gift just for being a listener of the Love You Podcast. Go to www.evanmarkcats.com forward slash free dash trial. And I will give you two weeks free in my Love You course, specifically about confidence, getting over the pain in your past, uh, realizing why it's important to believe in love, and getting back out there with uh, more confidence. This course has changed over a thousand people's lives already. You could be next. www.evanmarkcats.com forward slash free trial. Now we're going to get heavy because uh, I want to start this podcast with a uh, confession and a story. And uh, I have a point. I just always take a while to get to it. Uh, my First of all, the confession is my, my confidence is not an act. Um, uh, it came from my parents. I was raised in that you know, uh, little Jewish bubble where your parents tell you you can do anything if you just believe in yourself and you know, work hard in elementary school and you'll get good grades and you'll get into a good college. And I, I really bought into all of that and um, always believed that I was destined to do big, great things. I remember telling my dad when I was 16, Dad, I, I'm not like other people. I've got big arms. It was, it, it's the kind of thing that you look back at. It's kind of embarrassing. But I, I thought I was just different than everybody else and I was going to go out and prove it and um, you know, did whatever I wanted in college. And, and uh, then I came out of college and life just kicked my ass. It just it completely kicked my ass. And people talk about millennials being, being entitled these days. I, I, 20, 25 years ago, I was sort of the same thing, right? I was just really precocious, so always thought I was the smartest guy in the room and ended up getting fired from pretty much job, every job I ever had. And being a hard worker and having a big brain does not entitle you to anything is what I quickly learned. Um, you could ask Hillary Clinton if you're being a hard worker and having a big, big brain is, uh, is uh, a guarantee of success because it is not. Um, but so much of and where I'm going with this is, is, is the piece about confidence. Um, I, I do, like myself, um, I do believe I could do big things. And, uh, and I'm going to bring this back to you. It's not going to be all about me. Um, but my confidence is why I came out here to be a screenwriter. And it's why um, I get to do this job where I'm just a, a dude with a lot of experience and a lot of opinions. And it's why I've dated a lot and uh, had some success and I had a lot of failure and kept getting back up. Um, it's, it is. It comes from within, and um, I'm very, very lucky to have it. And at the same time, I want to confess that having high self-esteem is not enough because there's always cracks in your self-esteem no matter who you are, no matter how confident you are. Uh, we all have cracks in our self-esteem. Mine came from anxiety. Um, I nearly dropped out of college my senior year at Duke uh, because I had... I developed an anxiety disorder in December of my senior year, and I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep and was in therapy twice a week, and it came out of nowhere and knocked me sideways, and I'm very, very sympathetic to people with mental illness because of that. Uh, and then I got out of college, and instead of going to law school, I decided to come to L.A. to be a screenwriter, and uh, my 20s were just a wash. I was even talking about it with my wife last night. She's like, oh, you know, I think you... Uh, I think you, you, know, you, you focus on the negative in your 20s. And I was like, you know, you're forgetting all the highs that you had. And I was like, I really did not have, have that many highs in my 20s. I, you know, I was, I was a, a, a failed screenwriter, and uh, my, my dad died, and I was doing odd jobs, making no money. And um, I was in a city far away from home and, and sort of struggling to, to make friends and suffering from anxiety and depression. And no, I, my, my 20s were a wash, right? And that's... That's like my, my low point. So this podcast is titled, Do You Feel Like You're Not Good Enough? And from a guy who's always telling you to have confidence and a guy who has a ton of confidence, which is what allows me to do here, I want to read something to you um, that's, that I stumbled upon in my computer yesterday. It's terribly sad, um, but I think, I think it brings up something interesting. Um, about how the difference between confident you and insecure you is, is razor thin. Um, this is a journal entry from November of 2001. It's 15 years ago. I cry at everything. 
I can't help myself. I'm not sure if this is normal or if there's something very seriously wrong with me, but my emotions are so close to the surface that they boil over in almost every circumstance in my life. I've never been this way before, and I'm not sure how to fix it except just to deal with it as best I can. All I could come up with on my own is that I've got a tremendous amount of sadness that I carry around with me wherever I go, and that the sadness seems to need its outlet, and it finds it everywhere. It's my mom's 55th birthday today. My sister came home from New York City yesterday to take her out to dinner. They went to the cemetery to visit my dad's grave. I woke up next to a sad and lonely girl named Tiffany who's more vulnerable than I am. I'm using her, and she knows she's going to get hurt, but it doesn't matter. She'll stay with me, despite my unemployment and depression, until I tell her that I don't want to be with her anymore. She wanted to get me bagels for breakfast, but I was busy arguing with the unemployment office. I finally spoke with a supervisor who still couldn't guarantee me that I'd get my benefits, even though I was diligently looking for work, filling my forms, and reporting my minimal income. Tiffany left while I was on the phone. My Saturday afternoon was empty. I'd love to have a regular basketball game to go to or have a buddy to go ro rollerblading with, but I didn't. My friend Jason told me earlier in the week that he'd be around, and I called him at 12. He was on the line with his parents and said he'd call me back in a minute. An hour and a half later, I decided to go see a movie, even though it was 70 degrees and sunny outside. After the movie, I got back to the car with two minutes left on the meter. The same homeless man I saw before the show was planted next to the wall in front of my car. I dreaded him asking me for more money. He didn't. Instead, he asked me for a cigarette. I told him I was sorry but that I didn't have any, and I got into my car. I put the key in the ignition, but I didn't turn it. I thought about the things that really matter in life, creating, connecting with family, being happy. And then I pulled out of the theater parking lot, out of line of sight of the homeless man, out onto Wilshire Boulevard, and I started to cry like I haven't cried in years. That was the diary entry of a very lonely person who is fo focused exclusively on his failures. But it wasn't really me. It was me at a very, very specific point in time. Disconnected, emotional, drowning in my set of false expectations. Um, it was... It was just a snapshot in time. It wasn't my definition. That's not who I always was. And it took me a long time to get past that to realize that. So if you're still with me, I want to ask you to think of yourself at your happiest. What time in your life were you just the happiest? What time in your life did you experience the most joy? Did you feel the most connected and light and free and self-expressed? I also want you to stop. Right? You could write that down. I also want you to stop and think of the time that you were the most down, right? where life didn't seem like it was worth living. What's the difference between those two people? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that sad you is just as nice as smart and funny and sensitive and tenacious you. So the issue isn't that you're a different person Really, you're fundamentally the same wherever you go, wherever you are. It's, it's that you're focused on different things. Right? You're the same person when you're flying high and when you're down in the dumps. It's just where your focus lies. Uh, before this podcast today, I was talking to, to David behind the camera about you know, how 2016 has been a really challenging years in, year in some ways. And it feels almost silly to talk about the things that went wrong in this year because I have this wonderful life and this cool job and great wife and kids and complaining seems petty and it does um, so you always have to remember to, to pull back and look for gratitude um, I know that I uh, part of the reason that I, I draw criticism uh, is because I, I sometimes seem invulnerable I say hey I've got this great life and I've got this amazing marriage and those those things are true uh, I, I put the, that marriage up for people to say, hey, it's possible for you too. Um, but sometimes when you, when you do that, uh, you, you come off as invulnerable or arrogant or something like that. And um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I, I'm, if anything, I'm, I've, I've been through my own shit just like anybody else. And um, it's forced me to reflect and become better at appreciating things when they're good um, than lamenting things that when, when they're bad. When I was down 15 years ago, uh, in between my screenwriting career and my dating coaching career, I had a shrink. <clears throat> and I remember she made me go home and make a list of my strengths and my weaknesses. 
I, I tried to dig it up on my computer. I couldn't find it. But it's, I think it's a challenging exercise, right? Just take out a piece of paper, make two columns. What do I like about myself? What do I not like about myself? And just see what comes out. Just pour it all on the page. See what comes out. Um, what I discovered was that at that time in my life, the list of the things I didn't like my, about myself was twice as long as the list of things I did like about myself. Right. If I did the same thing today, I'm presuming it would be reversed. And the real truth is both lists are 100% true. They're both there. It's what you're focusing on at the time. Um, but when your weaknesses are the focus of your life, what's wrong with your life is the focus of your life, think about going on a date. How could you go on a date? Good luck with that when you're really that down on yourself and your life, right? When what you believe about yourself is the worst part of you instead of the best part of you. So it's always a glass half, half empty, glass half full thing, right? right? It's always both. It's what are you going to choose to focus on? Um, the problem is we get stuck in our stories, especially when things are intense, right? Someone goes through a terrible breakup and it's, I'm never going to date again. Men are terrible. It becomes, right, it, be it, it becomes almost set in stone. And then we work off of our, our, our new paradigm, where you're, the new paradigm is really just focused on one point in time. At one point in time, I was miserable, penniless, disconnected, sad, depressed. Right? That was at one point in time. Um, but that's not destiny. You, you have the ability to always change your destiny. So in the second half of this Love You podcast, I'm going to try to redirect uh, my pity party and your pity party into proactive self-help. I'm going to give you seven steps into your inner reservoir of self-esteem so that you can attract the love that you really, really deserve. Thank you for listening to my sad story, and we'll be right back. Uh, this is Evan Mark Katz on the Love You Podcast. Hey, this is Evan Marquette, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women and your personal trainer for love. Welcome you back to the second half of this week's Love You podcast. Do you feel like you're good enough? Um, do you feel like you're not good enough? Right? And this is a topic that I'm well aware that you can't cover in a 25, 30 minute podcast. Um, in the first half of this, probably tuning in late, I wanted to, to wanted you to know that even the most confident people do suffer from moments or years or in my case nearly a decade of self-doubt but that is not necessarily one's destiny essentially every day you have a chance to reinvent yourself you don't have to be who you were yesterday you don't have to be who you were in high school you don't have to see yourself as that poor little girl whose father didn't pay attention to her like that's that's a thing in the past right it may dictate who you are and how you feel but it is not set in stone uh, we have a growth mindset here we're always thinking, how can we do this better? How can we change? How can we grow? So I want to acknowledge that even if you came from a broken home or if you have parents who verbally or physically abused you or that you were told by people that are supposed to love you that you weren't good enough or if you partnered with men who acted in any of these ways, this might sound like some sort of impossible task, the task of summoning your self-esteem and, and putting yourself out in the world and and carrying yourself with the confidence that you deserve, the confidence that's going to attract the right kind of person. But it is, is not. Right? There, there's, you know, it's hard, but it's certainly not impossible. Um, and forgive me for using a sort of clunky comparison, which is sort of fraught with all sorts of uh, baggage given the political climate. But I think it's closer to, if you're, if you're coming from a, a background of low self-esteem, uh, it's closer to what it's like to be black in America, where you're, you're starting from, you know, 10 yards behind the starting line, right, and you have to play catch up. It's just harder for you to achieve the same things, but it's possible to achieve the same things, right? The point is that dating is tricky, and the single best predictor of your successful relationship in the future is your confidence, having a secure attachment style as opposed to letting your insecurities and fears run your life and your communication skills. Right? And if you suffer from low self-esteem and you can't just 
snap your fingers and make it all come back. Uh, it becomes a constant grind to not let your past and your insecurities beat you. And uh, because I'm so uh, steeped in this and had so many of these conversations, I've been coaching for 14 years, and I've had so many of these conversations one-on-one, -on -one. I, I wrote an entire book about it. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really do that much self-promotion on the Love You podcast. Um, but uh, the book I wrote in 2014 is my, my favorite one easily. It's called Believe in Love, Seven Steps to Getting Over the Past, Embracing the Present, and Dating with Confidence. And it might not single-handedly make you feel like you're good enough, but it'll give you a jolt of optimism and realism and excitement about sort of reinventing your story um, and taking it to a better place, choosing a partner who really appreciates you for all that you are. And just for the second half of this podcast, and probably spend a minute on each thing, I want to talk about the seven steps that are in Believe in Love. This is far from giving away the whole book, but it's a, it's a sort of a decent overview of what the seven steps are. The first step for anybody who suffers from a lack of confidence is to let go of your past. That's not easy. We are a sum total of our experiences, right? I, I can't deny my past, uh, how, how I grew up or who I was in college or how rough my 20s were, and, right? You can't just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, but you can't let it dictate your, your future. Um, Greg Barron, who, who came up with the, the, the book, uh, He's Just Not That Into You, uh, which is you know, sort of like a catchphrase more than it's a book now. His second book also had a title that was really catch, catchy uh, to the point where you almost don't, don't even have to read the book. And he said, it's called a breakup because it's broken. <laughs> so when we talk about letting go of your past, I'm not just talking about your past as a, as a kid. We're talking about your past relationships. Every relationship that you had that broke up was supposed to break up, not in any sort of cosmic divine intervention universe type way, but it's called a breakup because it's broken. If it were working, you would still be together. If you were compatible, you'd still be together. If he loved you and could tolerate your flaws, you'd still be together. Uh, it's, I always think of it like puzzle pieces fitting. And, or you know, putting on a pair of shoes or something. If it doesn't fit, it's not, it, it, you could try to issue blame, oh, I could have done this better, he could have done this better, but at the end of the day, the puzzle pieces don't fit, and you don't try to force them in, you just accept the fact that they don't fit. So when we're talking about letting go of your past, it's really important to remember, hopefully you can, you can learn something from your previous relationships. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna get caught in that situation again. Oh, I'm gonna cut this guy off a little bit earlier, but, don't hold on to your past and glorify it. Right? Oh, I once dated this guy who was tall, car tall, smart, cute, funny, rich, right? and I peeked out over here, and now all these other guys don't compare. Well, remember that guy that, that you, you're comparing to everybody was a selfish narcissist who ultimately made you feel terrible about yourself and destroyed your self-esteem. Right? So you're still holding on to this image right? that's sweeping away the bad stuff and just glorifying the good stuff. So when we're talking about letting go of your past, we're really talking about erasing the Etch-a-Sketch and completely starting all over and, and uh, giving each, each guy the benefit of the doubt, right, like a blank slate. The next step is called set realistic expectations. Um, <clears throat> part of the problem people have in dating uh, is that we all, we all project, we all fantasize. Um, I, I, I'm used to saying no man is real until he's your boyfriend. He's just hope, projection, fantasy, and potential. Uh, and reality proves that to be true, right? I, I, I joke about being a reality-based dating coach because so many people traffic in fantasy. But just, just, let's just look at it objectively. 90% of men are the wrong men, right off the bat. 90% of the men you would not date in a thousand years. And as, as well you should, those, those, those are your standards. My, my amazing, smart, strong, successful women who listen to me, 90% of guys, not suitable for you. Next. So if 90% of men are off the bat not right for you, should it be any surprise if 90% of the men who write to you on match.com are not right for you? Delete. Or 90% of the men you meet in first, on a first date you don't click with? Next. The problem is people expect it to be otherwise. We know this is true. Just scroll through Match.com. Just go on a bus. What percentage of guys do you think, just off the bat, you'd be interested in? 
well, let's just say 10%, right? That you have standards and, and, and you're, you're gonna choose from 10% of people. So I encourage you to be a short-term pessimist about dating. Yes, I use the word pessimism. I wouldn't expect anything from the next guy you meet, the next guy who writes to you, the next guy who approaches you. I wouldn't expect anything. I would expect that eventually you're gonna find a guy who makes you happy for the rest of your life because 50 million people, 50 million women here in America have. So I'm confident that you could be one of them. Uh, we don't need to give up. But let's not get too down about the fact that 90% of the men are the wrong men uh, any more than we get down about the fact that it gets colder in winter. It's, it's all very, very predictable. So we're setting realistic expectations. You don't get on Match.com and say, I'm going to pay for one month and I'm going to find a husband. You're setting yourself up for failure. You don't go on a date as if it's a husband hunt. I hope this is the one. I hope it's the one. And, oh, I'm so deflated. He's not the one. Well, I already told you that. 90% of guys right off the bat are definitely not for you. So going in with a realistic set of expectations is really important for dating. Otherwise, it becomes this emotional, self-imposed roller coaster instead of seeing things as they are. Going on a date with someone is like sitting next to someone on a plane. That's pretty much how random it is. You don't get your hopes up that the guy you're sitting next to on the plane is your future husband. Don't get your hopes up too much about the guy that you're having drinks with on, on a Friday night. Next, overcome negativity. It's the third step in Believe in Love. And I borrow from a guy named Michael Singer who wrote a book called The Untethered Soul. Uh, Eckhart Tolle wrote something about this in his Power of Now or New Earth. It's basically a concept that says, your thoughts are not you, right? I'm sure there's Buddhists who've done this better uh, and have translated better, but essentially we are not our thoughts. Um, the person in our head, that self-critical person who says that we're not good enough and that we're horribly flawed and that we're, met, we're doomed to be alone forever and a right, person who beats herself up, if you had a friend like that in real life, right, who said those things to you that you say to yourself in your head, she wouldn't be your friend anymore. That's how terrible she is. All right. So we have a hard time separating. We think we are that voice, but that voice is actually separate from you. You have to observe it when it comes up. Oh, that mean voice in my head is talking again. I'm going to ignore her. Really? Instead of assuming that you are synonymous with your voice. There's a, again, the book, The Untethered Soul goes really deep. It's a, it's a quick read, probably 150 pages or something like that. That, that is almost like a college style lecture that talks about this. But once you realize you are not your thoughts, it's very freeing because then you could step back and observe your thoughts. Oh, I was being pretty mean to myself there. Oh, I was acting a little crazy right there. Well, let, me, let me sort of step back from this and realize I don't have to be beholden to every thought that's in my head. Fourth step in Believe in Love, defeat your fear of failure. You have to come from a place of abundance. You can't treat every man like he's the last man on earth. You can't stay with a guy just because he was nice to you for a month or because he has potential. You always have to tap into your body, tap into your feelings and say, how, how do I feel in his presence now? How do I feel when he's not around me? Do I feel safe or do I feel like I'm walking on eggshells and then I'm always worried he's going to dump me? You really got to trust those feelings and realize that if you're not feeling good within your relationship, your relationship isn't serving its purpose. And the best thing you could do is let a guy go if he's not making you feel good instead of staying right, because you feel that men are scarce. It's hard to find a good one, so I'm going to stay in something that doesn't make me happy. Men are abundant. They're everywhere. Right? And if 90% of them aren't right for you, that's fine. Right? Just keep folding your hands until you find one that, that you could play. Um, the next tenet that I want to talk about in uh, Believe in Love is called Reframe Your False Beliefs. And again, I'm, I'm whizzing through a 250-page book to give you an idea of what's in it and how simple some of these concepts are. Reframe your false beliefs. We all have limiting beliefs, uh, and uh, as I alluded to earlier, we think that they're the whole story. If you've ever met a guy who says, women are crazy, women are just too emotional, women are gold diggers, right? women are selfish, You've heard these things before. Um, that's been his experience with women, but he, he hasn't dated every woman on the planet. He hasn't dated you, and it, and it seems unfair to, to tar all women with the same broad brush. Maybe his experience is true. Maybe that, that is exactly what he's experienced, but 
Those are just the women he's chosen. Those are just the women he led into his life. It's not, certainly not representative of every woman on the planet, much less you. And so you've got to be careful not to fall victim to the same kind of thinking. Right? Men are cheaters. Men are pigs. Men are self-obsessed. Men are liars. Men are narcissists. And really, that, that there are men who are all of those things. Right? But the common denominator is that you chose them. Right? It's not indicative of all men on the planet. Choose your decision-making mechanisms and, and you're going to find a lot less evidence of the thing that you believe to be true about all men. We have to realize that all of these preconceived beliefs that we have are always partially true. That's how we arrive at them. But they're never totally true. Never, never, never totally true. And we have to stop turning the other into monoliths. Uh, another political statement, which we'll reserve for another day. Step six, carry yourself with confidence. Right? I already mentioned the concept of what would you do if you, you knew you could not fail. Right? Um, I live my life by it. It's not for everybody. It requires a lot of risk taking. Right? But I created a podcast because I saw other people are doing it and I said, why shouldn't I? Um, you know, I started giving my opinion and I wrote a book about online dating when I was working in customer service in an online dating company because why shouldn't I? I came out to Hollywood because Friends was on the air, and I said, that looks fun. Why shouldn't I try to write for Friends? And so when you, when you go into something with that sense of confidence and optimism that, yeah, I, sh I should succeed, right? And what's the worst thing that happened? I fail, and I, I try something else. I, I date someone, I try something else. I try this job, I try something else. Right? Once you realize that the only real failure is not trying, <laughs> sitting on the sidelines, giving up, that's failure, not trying something and looking bad or falling on your face. I, you might think it's failure, but the person who falls on their face gets back up and does it again, gets better, right? or tries something else. All right, so remember that. It, that's, that's hard. People think failure is doing, some, you know, doing something wrong, making a mistake. All right? Failure is when you either give up all right, or when you stay in something that's really not working for you. Failure is staying in a bad relationship, right? Or quitting relationships entirely, not continuing to try to find the right guy. And then, of course, um, the final step in uh, believe in love is take action. All this stuff is just talk. You could, you could hear everything I say. You could take copious notes on it. You could replay it in your car. But all this stuff is just philosophy. It's just different ways of thinking and looking at the world. It means nothing without action which is why, although I'm supportive of, say, uh, spiritual beliefs and the law of attraction and making, having positive mantras to make you feel good about yourself, you could have a, a vision, ball, vision board the size of Texas, uh, and if you don't go on a date, it's not going to do you much good. Um, ultimately, this is, is taking steps. I call them in, in, in my Love You program, I call them small wins. Listening to this podcast in and of itself is a small win. You're taking a step forward. Bigger step forward is if you did some of the things I asked you to do on this call. Wrote them down. Right? Did some of the exercises. Right? Next step is buying Believe in Love or op, you know, opting in to get two free weeks in Love You on confidence. Right? And just letting it wash over you. Right? Going on a date. Putting up an online dating profile. Going out with a guy who you don't like and writing him a polite rejection letter the next day. Going out with a guy that you don't like and making it into a pleasant evening even though you're never going to see him again and not letting it throw you too much. These are all small wins. So I really, really encourage you to, to take action. Um, and if you just take action, the tiny, tiny little steps, you get to your destination. It doesn't happen, have to happen tomorrow. It doesn't happen, have to happen next month. But all of these small wins accumulate and the next thing you know, you find yourself in the position to meet a great guy who really appreciates you and the work that you've done to get there. So if you want to learn more uh, and get Believe in Love, just go to evanmarkkatz.com forward slash products forward slash believe dash in dash love or just go to the products page on Evan Mark Katz and scroll down. Uh, it's my favorite work, um, Believe in Love. I think you're really going to enjoy it and I believe there's a money back guarantee on it. Um, as for what happens now, I appreciate you joining me on the Love You podcast and letting me be vulnerable with you and go on my tangents and tell my stories. My name is Evan Mark Katz. Next week, I'm talking about 
an interesting subject that I haven't seen anybody talk about before. It's uh, what it means to be cool. Uh, this is different than being the cool girl, but is instead about what I think makes different people more relatable, likable, and attractive to others. So it's something you're going to want to tune in for. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can subscribe to the YouTube channel or iTunes. Um, look beneath the video for links. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, if you really want to change your life, go to www.evanmarkkatz forward slash free dash trial to get two free weeks in Love You about confidence uh, that will change your life. And it's absolutely free. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.